Great. Hi, everyone. Welcome. We're just letting the members of the public join. So we'll give it a minute before we get started. But thanks for being here today. Okay, I think we are good to go. So good afternoon, everyone, committee members and members of the public joining us for this meeting. Um, I'm Cody Zeger, the Director of Statewide Policy here at the California Interagency Council on Homelessness, and I have the pleasure of opening our meeting today. Uh, thank you all for your commitment in joining our efforts to prevent and end homelessness in California and for joining us at this meeting today. So just a few reminders before we begin. This is a two hour meeting and we're gonna do our best to hold to this time frame. However, there's always a possibility we may go over that timing slightly. Prior to this meeting, uh, committee members were provided with uh, meeting materials, which are also available on our website. We will try to leave some time for committee members to ask general questions toward the end of the meeting. But if we run out of time, please feel free to reach out to Cal ICH staff with any questions after the meeting. So we can go to the next slide. So our agenda today, uh, we're gonna open the meeting with our call to order and a tribal land acknowledgement. Um, we're gonna vote on the consent calendar. And then we're gonna hear from our executive officer, Megan Marshall, uh, with updates about Cal ICH's work. We're gonna have a quick discussion about uh, advisory committee co-chair roles. Um, so we will talk about that. We're also going to talk through the action plan and the, the next sort of phase of feedback we're hoping to get from you all on the vision and the guiding principles for the action plan. Um, then we will be joined by the newest BCSH secretary, Secretary Tamika Moss, for her to introduce herself. We wanted to give you all a chance to meet her and, and get to hear from her a little bit. And then we will move to general public comment um, and adjourn the meeting. So at the end of today's meeting, as I just said, there will be an opportunity for general public comment. We allow for a maximum of two minutes for each comment, and we welcome all public comments and feedback. However, due to the structure of the public meeting we're in, we may not be able to respond to all comments. For this reason, if you have specific questions that you would like answered, we ask you to please email us at calich at bcsh.ca.gov. That uh, email address will be in our slides uh, at the end of this presentation. So with that, the advisory committee to the California Interagency Council on Homelessness is hereby called to order on May 21st, 2024 at 1.08 p.m. I will now pass it to Cal ICH staff member Vavila Blossoming Bear to read the Tribal Land Acknowledgement. Thank you, Cody. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Vavila Blossoming Bear, as mentioned, and I serve as the Tribal Liaison for the California Interagency Council on Homelessness. My people are from the Choctaw Nation, and I'm also an individual with lived experience in homelessness. We wish to acknowledge that Sacramento is the unceded homeland of the Southern Maidu, the Valley and Plains Miwok, the Nisinan people, the Potwin Wintun people, and members of the Wilton Rancheria tribe who have inhabited this landscape since time immemorial. We extend our gratitude to the ancestors of all California Native American tribes and their descendants, as we recognize that wherever we are joining from in our virtual community, we are all on California Native American land. Thank you. Great, and now Claire, you can call roll. All right, this is the attendance roll call for the committee. We need a majority of members or a quorum to officially meet and hold this meeting. Advisory committee members, after I call your name, please say present or here, and apologies if I mispronounce any names. Ludmilla Fade. Present. Thank you, Ludmilla. Al Ballesteros. Present. Thank you. Samantha Batko. Present. Doug Bond. Present. Carolyn Coleman. Joe Coletti. 
Here. Thank you. Charlene Dimas Peanado. Vika Eisen. Here. Thank you. Dora Gallo. Jennifer Hark Dietz. Here. Thank you. Eric Harris. Here. Thank you. Charles Helgett. Here. Janet Kelly. Present. Thank you, Present. Janet. Jody Ketchaside. Present. Margo Cashel. Philip Mangano. Chris Martin. Present. Thank you. Mariah McGill. Luana Murphy. Present. Thank you. Alisa Ordunia. Present. Thank you. Sharon Rapport. Present. Thank you. Janie Roundtree. Emilio Salas. Miguel Santana. Doug Shoemaker. Sean Spear. Reba Stevens. Present. Thank you. Megan Van Zandt. Present. Thank you. Alex Vitsotsky. Javon Wilkes. Present. Thank you. And Roxanne Wilson. Present. Thank you. So I believe we have a quorum, unless anybody's dropped off. So I will move us on to our next agenda item. So the consent calendar. So um, the consent calendar is for regular and non-controversial items that need to be approved by the committee via a vote where we do not expect discussion from members. That said, the committee may engage in discussion on any items in the consent calendar if they so choose. Sure. We have one item for the adoption of the February 5th committee meeting summary. Are there any comments from committee members? Okay. Before proceeding, since this is an action item that will result in a vote, we will now open up for public comment. Please keep comments to items on the consent calendar only, so the February 5th meeting summary. If your comment is not related to the consent calendar, there will be time for public comment at the end of this meeting. If you are connected through Zoom, select the raised hand icon in the meeting window on your computer, and I will um, unmute you and I'll allow you for a comment. For those joining us by telephone, you may press star nine to indicate that you would like to comment. Once I call on you to speak, you'll be instructed to unmute yourself and you'll have two minutes to make your comment. So I will check for any raised hands. Okay. All right, I see a public comment for the February 5th consent calendar. Could we please pull up a two minute timer? All right, is a staff member from Cal Sage able to pull up a two minute timer? Yes, I'm uh, pulling it up right now. Thank you. Okay, that person has now lowered their hand. Okay, so we can go back to the slides. Sorry, everyone.
since there are no public comments, um, would anyone like to motion to approve this meeting summary? So moved. This is Vitka. Thank you, Vitka. Second. Reba Stevens, I'll second. Thank you all. So we have a motion to adopt, and I will call roll for um, a vote. As I call your name, please say aye, yes. You may also abstain or vote no. So, Ludmilla Bade. Aye. Thank you. Al Ballesteros. Aye. Thank you. Samantha Batko. Aye. Thank you. Doug Bond. Aye. Thank you. Carolyn Coleman. Aye. Thank you. Joe Coletti. Yes. Thank you. Charlene Dema Pianado. Vika Eisen. Yes. Thank you. Dora Gallo. Jennifer Hark Dietz. Aye. Thank you. Eric Harris. Aye. Thank you. Charles Helgett. Aye. Thank you. Janet Kelly. Yes. Thank you. Jody Ketchaside. Yes. Thank you. Margot Cushell. Philip Mangano. Chris Martin. Aye. Thank you. Mariah McGill. Luana Murphy. I believe. Aye. Thank you, Luana. Elisa Ordunia. Yes. Thank you. Sharon Rapport. Aye. Thank you. Janie Roundtree. Emilio Salas. Miguel Santana. Doug Shoemaker. Sean Spear. Aye. Thank you. Reba Stevens. Aye. Thank you. Megan Van Zandt. Abstain. I wasn't present for the last meeting. Thank you, Megan. Alex Bitsowski. Javon Wilkes. Aye. Thank you. And Roxanne Wilson. Aye. Thank you. This motion, this motion passes. The meeting summary is approved. And I will now turn it over to Megan Marshall for the next agenda item. Thank you, Claire. Good afternoon, everyone. Again, I'm Megan Marshall, Cal ICH's Executive Officer, uh, here to offer a few updates and a few comments. Um, I will leave some time towards the end of my time uh, if there are any questions from the Advisory Committee, and I will stay for the duration of, of public comment for today's meeting in the event that there are comments uh, to, to my portion of today's agenda. So, uh, as many of you are aware, the Joint Legislative Audit Committee, also known as JLAC, requested an audit of the state's homelessness funding uh, which included an evaluation of the efforts undertaken by the state and two cities to monitor the cost effectiveness of, uh, of spending investments in housing and homelessness. The final report focused primarily on the state's activities within Cal ACH, um, and a separate report was produced for the cities of San Jose and San Diego. Uh, in its final report, uh, the CSA, uh, the California State Auditor, made four recommendations for Cal ACH to consider and ultimately, Cal ICH, Cal ICH submitted a response that generally agreed with, uh, with the CSA. The recommendations and, and our responses can be found on the CSA website. I'll provide a link uh, at the end of my comments, but we'll, we'll give a verbal overview now. Uh, the first recommendation is to ensure that its 2024 update to its action plan aligns with statutory goals. Uh, that the Homelessness Council is how uh, we were referred to in the audit should clearly identify in that update, the statutory goal or goals that each of the action plan objectives addresses, which is a, a, a whole lot of mouthful. Uh, so to, to simplify, um, the auditor's recommendation is to use our, our statewide action plan to prevent and end homelessness 
uh, to embed in there uh, the 19 statutory uh, um, obligations and areas of oversight that are named in statute for Cal ICH. Uh, we've never used the action plan in that way before, uh, generally agree with the recommendation. And I'm sure as, as you all are aware, and we'll certainly hear a little bit more on today's agenda, uh, I believe from, from Cody and his team around the intentions for the updated action plan. Uh, that seemed an easy enough recommendation for us to adopt. Uh, as I mentioned, there are 19 statutory goals that are attached to Cal ICH uh, and name Cal ICH specifically as the oversight entity or lead entity. Um, we, had, we had not used a, a tracking system for those 19 goals previously. The action plan seems a perfect place to do that. I'll move on now to recommendation number two, and I'll try to synthesize as much as I can. But again, we'll, we'll give you the link so you can, uh, you can read this for yourself. Uh, if you're interested. Uh, second recommendation is to promote transparency, accountability, and effective decision making related to the state's efforts to address homelessness. Uh, that we should, we being Cal ICH, should require all state agencies responsible for administering state funding um, uh, to, to report outcomes and uh, uh, fiscal, fiscal data. So each, each one of our council member departments and agencies who have a hand in supporting uh, funding efforts to end and prevent homelessness, the CSA recommends that those entities be required to report uh, outcomes and, and progress uh, to Cal ICH on behalf of those programs. There had been uh, a landscape assessment that was done um, in, in commenced in 2021. Um, I believe was published in 2023. Uh, I will double check that that year. Um, but that that came with significant fiscal investments from the legislature. It was a one time effort. And so the CSA is recommending that Cal ICH continue the efforts um, that were uh, that uh, were completed in the landscape assessment. We do that ongoing. Um, in general, yes, we agree uh, that this should be under the purview of Cal ICH. Uh, but we would need additional resources in order to, to actualize that recommendation. Recommendation number three is to ensure that the state has consistent, accurate, and comparable data for all state-funded homelessness programs. Uh, there is a date attached to this. It's by March 2025. Uh, and that we should work with COCs to implement standardized data requirements that programs must follow uh, when entering information into HMIS. Uh, this one, uh, our, our response to this, a little bit more uh, 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 multifaceted than, than the earlier responses, uh, Cal ICH uh, nor the state can, can require, um, uh, without funding, of course, cannot require for COCs to adhere to data requirements that differ from that of HUD. Um, but, you know, we'll work with our, our COC partners and with our partners in HUD, for that matter, uh, to ensure that all of, all of the data elements that we find um, that might be unique to Cal ICH that we identify the ways in which we can, or sorry, unique to California, uh, that we identify opportunities for, for consistent reporting um, in those spaces. Um, the, the issue of, of data quality, uh, we have a multi-layer verification system to ensure data quality. Uh, we also uh, have now AB 977, which, will, uh, which requires for, for any state program that has an investment in housing and homelessness, to enter into HMIS. And so uh, the, the, um, the opportunities that exist in fiscal year 24, 25 have not existed previously. Uh, and Cal ACH feels more than prepared uh, with, our, with our HDIS uh, to, to take on that particular recommendation. Um, there, were, there was one other recommendation, but again, there, that was specific to, um, it, it required legislative action. We didn't make a, a specific comment to it. Um, but with that, I will, I knew I said that I would do comment at the end, but for the advisory committee and the advisory committee only at this time, uh, are there any questions for, uh, or reactions to the audit? And Claire, you'll have to help me if you see, if you see hands raised. Absolutely. I'll do um, the unmuting. So Sharon, I will, um, you can unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Megan, for that overview. Um, I had a question about, I know you mentioned um, several of the recommendations require funding. Um, is that funding, could that funding be secured through like uh, HCD's um, part of their administrative, you know, funding that they're getting for programs like HAP? 
um, or that they've received in the past for programs like CAP. So just was curious about that. And then um, I was wondering, you know, uh, you mentioned that um, we cannot require, that the state of California cannot require COCs to report on things that aren't, you know, in uh, HMIS that aren't part of the HUD requirements, which makes sense. Um, I was wondering, if, are there other ways to provide incentives for local governments to, um, you know, add those questions or add those data elements to their HMIS? Um, and I, I realize that probably involves money, but are there other incentives that the council could provide or that HCD could provide in future funding? Sure, and thank you for the question, Chair. And I will say that um, Cal ACH as an entity, and this was, uh, I think this is my last update for this body, but it seems relevant for, for your question. Um, uh, the priority for, for my executive office at, uh, at this point in time is the transition, ensuring the, the transition of our existing grants and a number of our staff persons from Cal ACH to HCD. And that includes um, uh, HAP, ERF, and Family Homelessness Challenge Grant. Um, all of which have some degree of, of administrative funding attached to it. Cal ACH then moving into um, future fiscal year, certainly business next fiscal year and future years, um, puts us in a position of um, supporting the entirety of the council's work, not, not a specific program. And so would say that um, we will certainly explore all funding options, but as a, as a council body, not a particular department or a particular program. Thank you for that. Yeah, I, I think that makes sense. I guess I'm just wondering, um, you know, and I guess that's where my question is around HCD. Like a lot of the findings in the audit seem like they were specific to the programs that you all previously administered. And now that those have largely moved to HCD, is it something that HCD could take on as responsibilities. Um, so I'm just curious about that. Yeah. And, and, just to, and just to clarify, these were not findings, they're recommendations. And so the overall question of CSA was, can the state effectively evaluate uh, the cost effectiveness of housing and homelessness investments? Um, Cal ACH uh, was the highlight, I will say, of uh, or the low light, depending upon how you, you choose to look at it, of the report. Um, but we also had a uh, CDSS who was included um, with our housing support program, but that's an eligibility determinant program. So to compare HAP and ERF, which are not, do not have eligibility requirements against programs that have rigid um, uh, eligibility requirements and funding caps, sort of, I say apples to tires, like we're in two different sections of Costco at this point. Um, but generally agree with with uh, the CSA's recommendation that Cal ICH should be the entity within the state who makes these um, assessments ongoing. Um, so I, all I can say ahead of a final budget is that we're exploring all future opportunities inclusive, inclusive of every council member department and agency who has investments in housing and homelessness uh, to determine whether or not additional investments are needed or can be can be. Um, uh, can be supported uh, through other dollars from other departments for Cal ACH to expand in these areas of work. Claire, do we have any other questions? I don't see any other hands raised. Okay, so um, unfortunately our media colleagues have, uh, I would, as I've been characterizing it, um, have grossly exaggerated uh, the recommendations, and for the most part, they've not included Cal ACH's responses as a part of coverage. So that being said, and as many of you have heard um, uh, in the governor's statement in May revise, we were not surprised by the, the final report. And in fact, Cal ACH had begun work on addressing um, many of those recommendations in advance of the commencement of the audit. So uh, appreciate you all, your all support uh, in, in this area. Happy to answer additional questions if, if any are had. Um, but there is one more hand raised. Sorry, Great. Mike. That's fine. Yeah, thank, thank you um, for this. I can really appreciate number three, where you mentioned you talked about the transparency and accountability. Uh, but in, with number four, how much, my question is, how much resources is needed? 
and what and are we talking about funding? So there, there are, um, you know, ahead of the end of this fiscal year, commencement of next fiscal year, there's a number of bills that have been proposed that would lend themselves to addressing the needs for resources. Um, I do not have uh, any analysis in front of me now that I can I can offer in, in response, uh, a total response to that, but I can say that we did an assessment at the time that we responded to, to the audit. So it was an assessment of the landscape assessment was an investment from the legislature for approximately $5 million uh, and included X number of staff uh, who supported a contract. And so if Cal is, is is expected to continue those the, that level of analysis ongoing, what does that look like internally? Also knowing that our, our HDIS is, is in a very different place than it was at the time that the, the landscape assessment was completed. So we did do um, a resource analysis before we, we submitted the response to the CSA. Thank you. Okay, no other hands raised. Great. Uh, so the, the second update I'll offer um, is just from our, our March 27th uh, council meeting. It will say if you did not um, or were unable to attend uh, either in person or virtually, uh, it was uh, what we heard from our council members and members of the public who have uh, attended these meetings in the past that this was the best meeting uh, that, that Cal ICH has, has hosted, facilitated uh, the best amount of um, very robust response and engagement from each one of our of our council members. Um, and so uh, at that meeting, uh, the council heard and, and provided a subsequent vote on the recommendation that uh, the recommendations that this advisory committee developed. Um, I know over the course of several months, although I'm sure it feels like a lot longer than that, uh, to those of you who who partici actively participated on their development, uh, the council voted in favor of adopting the recommendations. Uh, this is the first time, it's very historic, it's the first time that our council has taken an action of, of, that, of that magnitude. Uh, and so are very excited, uh, number one, to have a process in place for this advisory committee uh, to provide recommendations and engage with the council uh, that is more concrete uh, than it is uh, tangentially uh, put in place. Uh, and so if, if you have not had the opportunity, I would encourage you to go back and watch at least the first 20 minutes of the March 27th council meeting. Uh, but wanted to, uh, for those of you who, again, weren't able to attend uh, the recommendations that this advisory committee um, proposed to the council were adopted. Uh, and you'll be hearing um, you know, more to come from, from Cody and his team on uh, the next steps there. So with that, I'll take another pause if there were any questions. Um, Ludmilla, I think you were, you were there in person. If you have any reactions to offer in terms of your assessment of the March 27th meeting, particularly as it relates to um, uh, the vote on the advisory committee recommendations, uh, would welcome that now. I'm I'm just really glad to see things moving forward. I, I um, <laughs> it, it was it was um, it was uh, great to be part of the process up in person. Thank you so much. I don't, I don't I don't have more detail that I can offer. Sorry. That's perfect. Thanks, Ludmilla. Um, so uh, very last uh, uh update or, or comments that I have to offer. Um, going back to a response that I, I gave to Sharon a few minutes ago. Um, Cal ACH is undergoing a tremendous transition uh, where we are going from a budget of many billions of dollars to a budget of about $15 million, and that is uh, due to the transition of our grants, our existing grants, to our sister department of housing and community development. Um, we have staff who are transitioning, you know, contracts transitioning, etc. Um, I've served almost 20 years in, in some level of government, this is the most uh, level of attention paid, I will say, for uh, the well-being of staff and for the well-being of, of recipients uh, to ensure that is, is least, uh, the least invasive process possible. Um, so HCD and Cal ACH are, are very excited to roll out uh, what, what these programs will look like uh, under HCD's leadership uh, and the, thereby freeing up Cal ACH to focus on uh, its core mission and its 19 statutory uh, obligations and 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 uh, areas of focus. We will retain uh, posts and we will do a, a, a more thorough presentation for this body in the, in the next uh, count in the next advisory committee meeting. 
Um, but just a few highlights, we will be retaining, uh, I'll start first with our tribal liaison. You heard from the Vila Blossoming Bear at the start uh, for the, the, the land acknowledgement. Uh, I felt very strongly that, uh, you know, we have a, a substantial and sufficient data to support Cal ICH's need for a tribal liaison moving forward. Um, the Vila has a tremendous reputation and, uh, and um, relationships invested in our 110 federally recognized tribes up and down the state. Uh, and so are very excited to retain her uh, as, a, as Cal ICH's official tribal liaison. She'll be joining uh, Cody's team in the statewide policy division. Uh, the, the division of statewide policy will continue under, under Cal ICH uh, separate from uh, the work of which is, is meant to be comprehensive and not program specific, obviously. Uh, the second division we will retain is the division of local initiatives and that team's focus is to support um, our cities, our counties and our continuums of care in the implementation of all of the state's investments. Uh, we are working very closely with each one of uh, their, their sister divisions, so to speak, uh, within the departments that have investments in these areas uh, to ensure that we are here as a technical assistance provider, a supporter of, of each one of those programs, uh, but to ensure that there's alignment across uh, those programs to ensure uh, ease of use and efficiency uh, for our, our local partners who are responsible for the implementation. And last, but certainly not least, is our, is our Division of Data and Research. Um, HCIS has tremendous, uh, currently has tremendous power and has a certainly um, a, an equal amount of potential. And so we're very excited to, to um, use this next fiscal year to uh, develop you know, uh, data sharing agreements with our council member departments and agencies, um, but also working more closely with our partners in academia. So. Um, the next year for Cal ACH will be, I think, very significant, uh, and we're very happy to have your all support. Uh, so with that, before I turn it back over to, uh, to Cody, I'll just pause uh, if there are any questions. All right. And so for again, for members of the public, I'll be here through public comment. Happy to hear uh, if there's any uh, any comments of the, the three areas that uh, I've offered input on today. So with that, I will turn it back over to Cody. Great. Thanks so much for that, Megan. I appreciate the updates there. Um, so a lot going on at Cal ICH, a lot of uh, really great work happening. And just want to echo Megan's comment about the um, recommendations from the advisory committee getting passed and adopted by the council. That, as Megan said, is the first time the council has adopted like recommendations from one of its groups that it has uh, advising it or providing feedback, right? So this is a big deal. Um, and we, as a transition into this item, want to talk a little bit about the possibility of having co-chairs for the advisory committee. So uh, as you all know, the committee adopted its charter almost a year ago at this point, actually doesn't feel like a year and it feels like more than a year somehow simultaneously. Um, but the charter outlines right, the roles and responsibilities for committee members and also left a placeholder for the possibility of creating these co-chair roles. And currently the other Cal ICH working groups and the lived experience advisory board are moving in the direction of creating sort of similar leadership structures. Um, to have folks who are sort of designated as the ones who are liaisons to the council, helping push forward uh, priorities, et cetera. So we wanted to bring this to the committee for you all to ask questions and sort of discuss the possibility of having chairs uh, of the committee to do similar work. So before we don't open it up for discussion, um, I just wanna provide a few details about what the co-chair roles could be responsible for. So on the next slide, yeah, perfect. Uh, you know, as I said, the committee charter allows for the creation of these co-chairs. At a high level, as I mentioned, the, the co-chairs would be responsible for advancing the committee's priorities, as well as really representing the committee in front of the council when necessary. I know in the past we've had folks sort of volunteer um, on a case-by-case -case basis to co come to the council meetings but really think it would be good to be able to help develop relationships between the council and committee members over a, a longer period of time. 
Um, so the chairs would hold a one-year term after which new chairs would be selected by the group. And some of the more specific roles would include assisting with the development of committee priorities and helping find ways to advance those items. As I said, representing the committee at council meetings when necessary. Engaging the committee members to gather input on work products, right? So a good example are the recommendations that you all put together, um, helping lead sort of the input process and, and helping us think through the best ways to get input from you all. Um, reviewing and providing feedback on agendas for these meetings in advance of each uh, committee meeting with Cal ICH staff and helping ensure that the committee meets timelines and tasks requested by the council. So, of course, all of these things would be done in partnership with Cal ICH staff to help with the administration and logistics the same way we do now, uh, but really trying to find ways to provide opportunities for committee members to sort of lead their lead the priorities of the group and, and push for the work to continue. And likely this would require some additional time commitment between meetings, uh, likely one to two extra calls with the Cal ICH staff between quarterly committee meetings, as well as maybe some time to review agendas and other work products. So just wanted to outline that um, for you all as a potential food for thought uh, none of this is set in stone, so we can talk about the details here and think about what might work for folks. Um, but if we go to the next slide, we can look at sort of the next steps for this process. So after this meeting and discussing these roles today, Cal ICH staff will send out a survey to sort of gauge your all's interest in co-chair roles. Um, this will help ensure that all members see the opportunity, even if they're not available to attend today's meeting specifically. So we'll send an in the follow-up email to this meeting, we'll send more, or we'll send the same information out uh, to committee members as, as along with a link to sort of gauge interest. Um, and then once we have that interest, we'll include an agenda item in our August meeting to review who said they were interested and sort of decide who our initial chairs will be. But before we ask folks to volunteer or suggest members, Excuse me, we wanted to give you all a chance just to discuss. So a few questions here, you know, what questions do you have about these positions and what work for, like, what work do you think the co-chairs could be doing to help, that would be helping us push the committee's priorities forward? Are there roles that you didn't see on that last slide that you would want to make sure are included or ways that you think that those roles could really improve our connection to the council? Um, so yeah, just wanted to open it up for your all's thoughts. We have some time to discuss. So if you have thoughts or questions, feel free to raise your hand. And we can we can talk. Yeah, Sharon. Hi, um, Cody, thanks. Um, I, I guess I'm just to make sure I am understanding. The co-chairs would kind of act as the intermediary between this committee and the council. And I'm just wondering if it, you know, if you have in mind like subject matter positions like healthcare and housing or, you know, where you're actually, the, the chairs might be delving into substantive areas and recommendations to provide the council members or, is it mostly like a, a like reporting out from this committee to the council? So just wanted to get a little clarity there. Yeah, good question. Um, I think it's not so topic specific, right? And I don't think that these are the only people that have to, you know, engage with the council, right? I think the idea would be to have uh, two or three folks from the committee saying, okay, we have a sense of like the council is going to be discussing this, you know, are we the right people to talk about it? Do we want to ask other committee members to step in, right? Given people's expertise, right? Just a chance to help. Like right now, Cal ICH staff is doing that thinking and we thought it would probably be better if, if some of you are, are all are engaged in that. So we're not just making decisions on behalf of the committee, right? So having a few members who can either represent the committee at meetings or identify folks who are appropriate to do that work, if that makes sense. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ludmilla. 
super quick, and maybe it was in the previous slide, and I'm, I had my attention on something else. Any co-chairs we're talking about here? There isn't a I good see it's a plural. Yeah, that's a great question. There isn't a set number. Uh, we were thinking probably two or three, just given the size of this group. Um, so I think we are open depending on how many folks are interested. Is that helpful? Cool. Great. Yeah, Roxanne. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Roxanne. Um, it, I think we're what we're trying to accomplish here is mirroring the the structure that exists on our, our greater council. The same ask is being made of our lived experience advisory board as well. And so happy to have, um, hoping to have a uniform structure for all of our um, our bodies of work. But again, you this advisory committee is unique given the number of persons, and so are open to having, um, you know, a, a few uh, perhaps one additional position than exists elsewhere. So my question is could have easily had been already discussed, but do you know what the time commitment would be for this? Yeah, so it's, I think it sort of depends, but I would, what I estimated and what we were thinking was likely how it would work is after each committee, each quarterly committee meeting, we would have probably a check-in just to say, here's what we know is coming at the council meeting. Um, here's what we heard at the last committee meeting. How do we want to move things forward? So that's probably one call. Um, and then another call before the advisory committee meetings, uh, just to talk through agendas, make sure that we are moving the work forward um, in the way that you all want it to move forward. And then potentially a little bit more work, just like reviewing agendas or work products or reaching out to other advisory committee members, right, for follow-up. So not a huge lift, but definitely some additional additional points or pieces there. Thank you. Any other committee members have questions or ideas for how to make these roles the most effective that they could be? Yeah, I mean, I, I just I just have the kind of one question here, which is, we don't really have an elected chair. I mean, I mean, you seem to be you function as the chair of this committee, I believe. Um, <laughs> but but as far as a chairperson from the advisory committee, so so I mean, I'm sort of I'm sort of doing this little swerve around to kind of get 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 my head around that concept that we are looking at a co-chair, but. Um, a, 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 like a, a peer co-chair of, of us, you know. Um, anyways, I, so so I was a little unclear on the status of the of the chair role. So yes, the yes, good, good, good clarification, Lamilla. So when I say co-chair, I guess I don't I don't mean like a second in command. I guess I mean multiple people who are chairs, right? So two or three people who are all in the position of chair. Um, I. Thank you for saying that. I do not consider myself the chair of this group. I consider myself a facilitator at best, um, but I appreciate that. Um, and yeah, I just, I think that's, I think we're talking about the same thing, Ludmilla, really finding two to three chair persons uh, to sort of represent the committee and help help move the work forward. Uh, Cause we know you all have a lot of ideas and, and priorities that we think could really impact the council's work. So just want to make sure that that is getting moved forward in the way that you want it to. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Reba. So it sounds like these co-chairs would facilitate the meetings moving forward. Um, that's a yes or no. Um, not necessarily. I mean, you wouldn't, I think okay. I think if if there are instances in which you wanted to, in which the chairs wanted to facilitate, definitely possible. But I think facilitation could still come from those who, depending on the agenda item, right? Yeah, I appreciate that. I I believe that where my struggle is is understanding the purpose uh, clearly of the um, co chairs. I did hear you say that there would be a you know 
a few calls to um, perhaps set the agenda. Um, I would imagine to review and support the creation of the summary as well as reporting out to the full council. Uh, but then I heard you say, ask me. Um, so I just think I'm I'm struggling with understanding really seeing the this. Yeah. Because I'm yeah. always I'm always interested in um some sense of power, you know, um, <laughs> when it comes to well, I'm just telling you the truth. Yeah. <laughs> um, <sense> of <laughs> Yeah, I hear you. So I think Cal ICH would continue to do some of the more uh, logistics. Uh, so like the, setting up the meetings, writing the summaries, right? Those pieces, really the goal, and I, I appreciate you asking this to help us clarify, help me clarify. The purpose is really to have some folks who are really thinking about what is our goal? What are our goals? What are our priorities as a committee? What do we want to accomplish over the next year? And how do we do that? Right. So that's going to be, you know, talking to the council, of course, and bringing out any recommendations that you all have, like helping us bring those to the council. It could also be working with the members of the different working groups or the lived experience advisory board. It would obviously be working internally within the advisory committee to say, OK, we know we want to do a project on. Um, I'm making something up, but like best practices for, you know, healthcare services and shelter. I don't know. I made something up, but like who do, who needs to be involved in that? Who should we talk to? How can we move that forward so that it gets to the council so that something, some action is taken on it. Right. So it's really to clarify about the priorities that you all have as a group and making sure that those are moving forward. We can still help at Cal ICH with the logistics and the, the meeting set up and the summaries and all of that. It's really just to make sure that your voices are represented um, in creating these meetings, in the council meetings, in your work that you're doing. Does that help? Thanks. Cool. Okay, Elisa, I see your hand. Huh? This might be uh, jumping ahead a little bit, but I, mm -hmm. I think for considerations around the co-chair, when I think about that role and, and Reba, I think I assume there will be, you know, a level of power in this and wanting just to make sure there's different diverse representation. So kind of both geographic representation and then not sure how to categorize it, but we have some mainstream organizations, we have advocates, we have smaller organizations. So making sure there's a balance in that voice as well. So geographic uh, size, and I definitely think uh, someone with lived experience should also be a part of that configuration. Yeah. Yeah, we would love to get as as representative of a group as possible in the chair positions. I think given that it's like two or three people, one thing we may do um, is think about what expertise those people do bring to the work and what expertise they don't bring to the work and try to make sure that, you know, we're reaching out to folks who, if, if they're not represented as chairs in that instance, right, that we make sure to reach out to folks with the expertise that are, is, not included in that group, but definitely hear you on that point. Uh, Megan, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to offer, um, I don't know how much this body is aware of what goes into the preparation with the council and with the co-chairs specifically of the greater council, um, but would imagine that this this uh, this co-chair model or, or tri-chair uh, tri -chair model, I guess, if, if we end up with three, uh, would end up looking like, but we review um, our proposed agenda with each of the co-chairs with their respective staff to ensure that um, each one is prepared and agrees that these are the issues that that are priority for discussion. Um, the same would be true for for the advisory uh, advisory committee co-chair or or tri chair uh, model. I'll just say co-chair because I'm going to stumble over my words if I don't. But um, so you know, these are the things that Cal ICH staff, being Cody and his team, these are the things that we understood our priority from our last meeting. Here's our proposed agenda. Here are the topics that we're hoping to accomplish. Um, because the advisory committee is so large in, in just the sheer number of advisory committee members, um, my ask and, and has been um, uh, seconded, seconded by our co-chairs for the greater council is that we have standing items on the agenda for the greater council 
where the advisory committee is coming on a regular basis to present, like, here are the things that we are focused on and here's our progress in moving towards those, those issues of concern. The same is true for our lived experience advisory board and for our greater working groups. And so wanting to give space for each of those bodies who are working uh, towards preventing and ending homelessness, uh, the opportunity to have time and space with our greater council. Um, and the way that we felt we could best accomplish that is by mirroring the, the co-chair model that currently exists within the greater council. So when we think of when I think of uh, time commitments and all of that, it is like, these are the things that we've heard from it, a debrief from the advisory committee meeting. Here are the things that we want to accomplish between now and the next advisory committee. Um, and this is primarily work that Cal ACH takes on directly or, or, or is disseminated to our, our, our various working groups. Um, and, you know, in advance of the advisory committee, here's our proposed agenda. Do the co-chairs agree? Uh, if so, great, let's post. If not, let's have a discussion. Um, and, and, and those being the, the, the persons who uh, would come and present to the, the various bodies, whether it's the council, whether it's the LEAB, uh, the Lived Experience Advisory Board, or to the various working groups. So I just wanted to offer, offer the thoughts on kind of orienting everyone to the time commitments and the, and the reason why. Um, really wanting to have a very clear line between each of our bodies, the council, the advisory committee, the LEAB, the working groups, to Cal ACH staff, um, including myself, uh, and to the, the other respective bodies that exist that are supporting this work. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, and I think there's room for this to grow and change as we, as we do it. We haven't done this yet with the advisory committee, as you know. Um, so we can adjust to as time goes on to make sure that we're getting the most out of the out of the work that we're doing together. Um, Reva, I see your hand up, but maybe yeah, that's what I, okay. yeah, yeah. I just want to jump on in there again. You know, as, as I was just I was listening, and you know, it, it's interesting because when I think about um, co chair roles, I'm curious if this is if there's a benefit. Uh, to being a co-chair in reference to knowing what's going on in the working groups, what's going on in the lived experience group in order to ensure that there's an alignment. And um, so if you could help us understand um, some of those benefits, if they exist uh, for advisory committee co-chairs or try, I won't say the trifecta, <laughs> on the try. Uh, yeah, that's a great idea. We could definitely consider also like once we have the sort of co-chairs or chairs in place in each of those groups, having some sort of meetings of those groups to make sure that everyone's on the same page and learning about what the other groups are working on so that we're coordinating. I think that's a great idea, Reba. Uh, Roxanne, I see your hand. More of a comment than a question. I do know that we've had troubles finding people to um, present to Cal ICH, the committee, the, yeah, not the committee, the council. And I do feel and support strongly the um, this role um, is very important because it just, it adds that responsibility to the co-chairs and it helps with just the efficiency of moving information between the two bodies. Yeah. Thanks, Roxanne. All right. Any final questions, thoughts? Okay. I don't see any other hands. So we will move to the next um, agenda item. But as I said, the next steps, right, we're going to send out a survey to gauge folks' interest. Um, and then we will follow up in August on this. So thank you all for the time and consideration on this. I'm excited to move this forward and get our work even more sort of connected with the council and the other groups and help move your all's priorities forward. Okay, now I am going to talk for like one more, two more slides, and then I will stop talking. Um, and hand it over to other folks. Um, but really excited to bring back our perennial discussion item around the action plan. I know we've brought the action plan up at many of our meetings and we will continue to do so. 
um, because we are in the process, as we speak, of creating the state strategy to prevent and end homelessness. Um, and your input has all been extremely valuable in shaping our priorities of that work so far. Um, so we're going to keep coming back to this group to make sure your um, thoughts and expertise get incorporated into that work. Um, today, we're uh, mostly going to hear from our partner, Matthew Doherty, about the draft vision and guiding principles for the new action plan. This is in response to a conversation that we had at the last council meeting, um, where the council really asked us to, you know, we presented a vision statement to them. Uh, and they were like, that's great, but we want it to be bolder. We want it to not only describe the work that we're doing, but really lead us to the future that we want to see. Um, and so that's sort of part of the discussion we're going to have. We're also going to talk about Cal ICH's guiding principles that are in our current action plan um, and making sure that those are either still the guiding principles that we want to include or if there are other things we want to add or edit or change. So really shaping like the vision of our work and, and what we are asking council members to commit to via our guiding principles. Um, but we're gonna go to the next slide. And before I pass it to Matthew, just wanna go over a bit of feedback we got from some of our members, both on the goals and structure of our new plan. So at our last meeting, we asked you to give us feedback on the structure and goals for the new plan. We then offered to meet separately with committee members who are interested in discussing these topics further. So we had, I think two smaller group discussions and are now reporting back the feedback that we got so that everyone can hear it. Um, some of what we heard around the structure of the plan was that, you know, we want it to be as specific as possible with our worth, work uh, and given given just the importance of really having clear messaging and right now. Um, we also discussed empowering people with lived experience so that peer support is a central part of programs and that policymakers can, you know, prevent creating unintentionally harmful policies. We heard about data sharing between health, homelessness, housing, and social services, also being a really crucial element of this work. And lastly, just talking about the need to support our workforce to ensure appropriate trainings are provided. Related to the goals of the plan, uh, we talked about the need to define what success really means related both to the goals themselves that we've laid out, as well as to our work in general. Um, and especially important to understand, you know, whether the people being served in our system are truly thriving, right? Like, what does it mean to serve someone effectively? Really uh, fleshing that out. We also need to help support the accuracy of data input and support data entry into HMIS. Part of this work may require having recommendations that come at a state level for sort of uniform data system recommendations. Um, additionally, given one of our goals was around street outreach, we were given, you know, feedback to be cautious around using street outreach data um, and really check for the quality of that data. So just wanted to say what came out of those smaller group conversations in addition to what we talked about as a, a whole advisory committee. We really appreciate all the discussions and feedback on those topics. And our next step for the action plan process, just to give you a sense of where we are, is to talk with each council member and their staff about their commitments that are gonna go into the new plan. So we're gonna be bringing all the feedback we hear from you all into those conversations. We also wanna get your thoughts about what work you'd wanna see them prioritize uh, within each of our council member departments and agencies. So we will also be sending out a survey for you all to fill out about what work you'd wanna see included in the plan from those members. So keep an eye out for now multiple things coming to you after the meeting um, in that follow-up email. So I will pass it. Oh, it looks like we have one question uh, from. Yeah, Riva I'll before. be. I'll be. Um, you know, thank you for this. Yeah. But I noticed that um, that's what's standing out to me. That's not here. Yeah. Is equity. Yeah, as far as like in it from our discussion. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oops, sorry. Excuse me. Thank you for that. Um, yes, I do. It's hard for me to remember now at this point, which came up in our full group conversations versus the small group. But I do think you're right. We spoke about the need to incorporate equity within each of the goals and within the structure of the plan and really like lead with equity in the plan. Um, so I think to that end, we are designing our goals to and we'll come back and talk about this more to have sort of measurement of disparities within each of the goals as well as a discussion of the need uh, of like, how do you implement 
programs in an equitable way, not just measure after the fact. So that's something that we talked about as well. Thanks, Reba. Anything to add to that? Well, I would only add that, you know, when we're yeah. looking at the goal of, you know, what does success uh, mean and what does it look like, right? So it's one thing, you know, that was, that was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I may have mentioned uh, this around the, the success piece, but I think that, you know, it's such a disservice to not uplift uh, what we know is, is currently happening right now across the state of California. And that would be the overrepresentation of Black people continuously, and then that rise in the Latina uh, population. So I just, I just need to, um, I just need to say that because it's an area in which I will think oh, that equity, but then in addition to that, racial equity. Thank you. Thanks, Reba. Great. So, oh, Megan, yeah. Sorry, Cody. So just at that point, I, I very uh, much highlighted our tribal liaison position that Cal Siege is retaining in this transition of grants. Another position that we're um, we're holding on to, um, we're hoping to structure as a as a companion position to the tribal liaison position to focus on other communities of color who are disproportionately represented in sheltered homelessness. Um, we are um, uh, prioritizing that position among a few others in terms of hiring, I think everyone heard and 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 may revise that uh, vacant positions are are um, going to be swept in the coming months as a result of of our budget situation. Um, but Cal Siege is working very diligently to firm up that um, duty statement so that we can have that position as a as a companion position to our dedicated tribal liaison. Thanks, Megan. All right. Okay, so without further ado, um, I will pass it over to Matthew to help us discuss uh, the this another important piece of the plan that we're hoping you all can help us shape. So Matthew, you can take it away. Great, uh, next slide, please. So it's good to be back with everybody. In case there's anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Matthew Doherty. I'm an independent consultant who's been working with the state and Cal ICH for the last several years and have worked on uh, the action plan process from the beginning of the original plan and its updates and now supporting the team and moving forward to a new, hopefully bolder plan for um, the years ahead. So uh, we've come in the past and talked with you about ideas for goals and ideas for activities and priorities. And in this, we want to raise ourselves up a, a little bit of a level to more of a vision of what it is we need to try to achieve and that we want the plan to communicate that we are striving towards. And then we'll also talk about the guiding principles that should be structuring how we pursue all of the work and the things that we are trying to be attentive to within, within the work of implementing plan. So we're gonna start with vision and then talk about the guiding principles and really want your insights on plans that you've seen that have been impactful, visions that are motivating, that really resonate, words, terms, some things that uh, we should be thinking about as we try to craft a powerful vision statement and uh, align guiding principles for the council to consider and then ultimately adopt as part of the adoption of the plan. So just a little bit of background information. The current action plan has a actually about a page of vision kind of language that talks about the central focus on equity and talks about the alignment of health and housing and trying to establish stronger leadership roles for the state in moving forward on the work of addressing homelessness, but then also in, includes this statement of a future in which homelessness in California is rare because it's prevented whenever possible, brief because it's ended quickly whenever it does occur, through a focus on housing first approaches and housing outcomes, and it's a one-time experience whenever it happens, ended successfully the first time so that no Californians experience homelessness repeatedly. So that's what's in the current plan, just for your awareness. Next slide, please. So as we tried to think about how to bridge between the current plan and the new plan that the council um, is working towards now, we drafted a revised vision for the new plan that we also were trying to really think about how to carry forward the action areas and the objectives, objectives of the current plan and reflect those in a revised vision statement that was clearer about some of the things that would need to have to happen in order to achieve the idea of homelessness being a rare, brief, and one-time experience. 
um, as the lead author of this text with input from others, I will I will acknowledge this didn't land great with the council. They really weren't they weren't this didn't really grab them in any meaningful way, um, and we we clearly didn't didn't quite get at what they were um, looking for, or they hadn't had time to think about what they were looking for yet. So they reacted to this, which I'm there's a lot of words here, but it does focus again on the rare brief in one time, and then is more explicit in the sub bullets about prevention focus on the health and services and safety needs of people experiencing homelessness, the need to both expanded interim and permanent, and then a clear statement around ending racial equity inequities and other disparities. Um, but the feedback that we got from the council was that they were hoping to find a vision statement that would be a little bit more aspirational and inspirational, that um, they wanted it to be a little bit more like a tagline that could be easily remembered and stated so we're probably looking for more something that's about one sentence with maybe one complementary sentence to add some nuance um, they wanted to clearly state the desired future we're aiming for what type of california are we trying to create um, and in general just something that was a little bit more pithy inspirational aspirational in its language and shorter i think it was also primary feedback so we've been wrestling with that. We're bouncing around possibilities, but we really wanted to hear from you and get a sense of um, your, your thoughts on what makes for a powerful vision statement, what's some of the language that we should be looking at um, as we then enter into kind of that drafting stage and think about what can respond to the council informed with your advice and guidance. So next slide, please. So we have some pretty open-ended questions um, you can respond to any of these questions. We don't have to go through them one at a time, but would love your thoughts on what's most important for the vision statement for this action plan to communicate, especially um, to respond to what you've heard is the council's guidance. Um, are there important qualities of the previous versions of the vision statements that we just showed you that you do think should get carried forward? Are there specific words or phrases that you think would help a vision statement resonate with you and with others? Um, and I also would love if there's examples of other vision statements that you've seen that you think we should look at and see see if there's ways that we can model some of those successful vision statements. So I'm gonna open it up. There are a couple of hands up, but I'm not sure if those are newly up or did, just didn't go down before. So um, I see Megan and Megan, but I'm not sure if those are new hands or carried over hands. Okay, uh, Megan Van Sant, yours is a new hand, right? So yes, jump. it's a new hand. Um, thank you. I um... I was I was I appreciate this this invitation to to provide a vision because I've I've had a uh, in recent weeks I've really had a little bit of a shift in the way that I've been thinking about the work that I do and also a recognition that the public is really done with this. So I do think that um it's important for us to acknowledge that the public's timeline for wanting to see results is much faster then we've been able to respond. And I think that's really, really critical that we acknowledge that reality. I do think that um, some of the reaction to the, the auditor's report and just what we've been seeing happening in the news and politically, there is a sense that the public have been noticing a great deal of funding going into um, homelessness and not seeing the results that they're expecting in the streets, in their neighborhoods. And that's just happening all across. And I think we have to be honest about that. So the the other piece that I'm I have been reflecting on is um, we collectively those of us who work in the homelessness field we do a lot of work with people experiencing homelessness that are under the the water level right they're not the tip of the iceberg there's just like a huge enormous that are not necessarily being seen on the streets they're not necessarily the ones the public are, are seeing but it's an enormously important problem and an enormously important population to reach at the same time <laughs> I think. I'm wondering if we've gone wrong in perpetuating a concept that we are going to save individuals and that we are going to provide them with housing and we are going to provide them with all the housing navigation and not recognizing that the most important and powerful agent in resolving homelessness is the homeless person themselves. They have to take that hard step. And I'm not talking right here necessarily about severely mentally ill or people that are deeply disabled. I'm, I'm going to set that aside as a different kind of category. But ultimately, if somebody needs to go into treatment, they have to make that decision. If somebody needs to find creative housing solutions, they are going to have better ideas than the rest of us. 
if we continue to perpetuate this idea that you get on a list of coordinated entry and someone's going to hand you keys to an apartment eventually, we're not helping. We're actually hurting. So to me, I feel like we need to maybe bring back the language that the homeless individual themselves is going to be the most powerful actor in resolving their homelessness. And we have to eliminate the barriers for them to do that, but they have to do that. And I know, no, I don't like the phrase personal responsibility. That's not what I mean at all. It has way too many political, you know, that's not what I'm saying. But I do know from the work that we've done, I have seen people pull leases out of nowhere, terrible tenants, find places to live, you know, come up with really creative ideas to resolve their homelessness, like crazy roommate situations, all kinds of things. And when we're able to provide when I think the most important thing that we can do is eliminate some of those financial barriers to the creative solutions that they already know. And so if somebody can find some crazy what place to live and we can give them security deposit, that is money well spent. But we have to empower them repeatedly. Don't go look for your housing navigator. You find the housing. You, you, have, you have good ideas. They know their own situation better than we do. And I think we've made a mistake in continuing to use language like, and I'm, I'm not getting on you, Matthew, but like provide blah, blah, blah. If you go back to your, can you go back to your 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 language that no one liked? And I'm saying that kind of <laughs> facetiously because you said it. But <laughs> when we use language, like we're going to provide these opportunities, we're disempowering the homeless person themselves and they're gonna be the most effective at resolving their homelessness. Um, so that's, that's what I would suggest, that we change the vision to be much more, um, empowering, not because it sounds nice and it's the right thing to do, but it's the only way that's going to work. Great. Great. Appreciate all that. And I think some of them could also translate into the guiding principles conversation that we'll follow this with. So appreciate all of that. Thank you. And yeah, no, have at it with these language. I I, I feel no defensiveness about it. Uh, yeah. other folks, uh, Javon, I, I think... Oh, go ahead. I just think, I think I saw Megan wanting to respond to that as well. So I just wanted to make sure that's all right. Thank you, Cody. Yeah, Megan to Megan. I know I lowered my hand, but uh, sorry for the, for the the interruption of those who who rose after me. But um, my only reaction to that is when we think about who the audience is for this action plan, and the audience is 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 meant to be the state and the recipients of these fundings. And so that's our counties, that's our cities, and that's our continuums of care. And so I th I think there's definitely a space for best practices um to be woven in throughout but this is meant to be a document a guiding document for um for the state itself uh for cities counties and continuums of care so i, I appreciate uh, you know self-determination for those populations that are able to to make those determinations for themselves um but just wanted to clarify who the intended audience is for for the uh the action plan great thank you Javon. Uh, dropping some some data that I've heard when it comes to children experiencing homelessness um, within a family, that child's experience of homelessness as they age um, increases drastically. When you have data that shows adults had their first experience of homelessness as a youth, that's an example. When you're in the foster care system, you age out. That's a cliff. When you age out of extended foster care, that's a cliff. When you're juvenile justice, countless uh, times of re-entry, exit, um, and services and housing is of importance. And then when you even think about education, you know, graduate from high school, that's a cliff. If you go to community college and further up, there are opportunities there to catch young folks before they slip into uh, homelessness. And with that, uh, when it comes to one time, we got to be realistic about the reoccurring, uh, the, the non-reoccurring nature in which we are trying to um, strive for. Um, with that, I look at it as a way to ameliorate. We make the current system that hasn't been built except for the last, I'm going to say, give us some, some major grace, uh, eight eight, six, eight years um, with all of the funding opportunities. And so one time we've been fighting for ongoing um, because we know that this did not happen overnight. Um, and with that, um, adding in that language that shows what the vision is to do, which is 
better people's lives to be able to thrive as an individual and as a Californian. Yep. Great. Great. Don't want to cut you off, Javon. Were you done there? I'm good. Great. Thank you very much. Can we go to the, I don't want people to feel at all restricted by this language. So can we go to the question slide or take the slide down? Um, just because it is like a blank piece of paper we can start with for thinking about what the vision will be. Um, so just other thoughts about things that help make a powerful vision statement, words and concepts that resonate with you, things you want to make sure we don't lose track of as we, we think about an updated vision. I don't know who's running the slides, but if you can move to the next slide, that would be great. And Jennifer, I'll go to you. Thanks, all. And, and to kind of follow up with what Javon just shared, I mean, I think I think for me, and I know I mentioned this last time, like if the state was willing to actually identify a goal, I think that could be a clear um, response to the commitment to Javon's point that we don't have an ongoing funding source, right? Like we, we are always kind of operating with this advocacy and this need in mind. The other thing that came to mind was like the benefit to folks who are um, both living unhoused and living housed, right? So having, how do we have it come together because it really is about our communities, right? And both are part of our communities. And then last, it kind of reminded me with President Obama's um, no wrong door, right? It was just kind of like a, a quick, like when you thought of it, it was like no wrong door, but when you dove into it, there was more detail, right? How are we going to get there? What did that look like for federal systems? So I was thinking of of that too, just as an example of something that I do feel like folks were able to kind of get behind relative to maybe whatever department they were a part of. So those were just kind Great. of some of the things I was thinking of. Great. So what do you have thoughts? What uh what the equivalent of a no no wrong door? I think I have to think about that. that. <laughs> I'd like to add on to that. Thank you, Jennifer, for awakening that part of the conversation because Medi-Cal um and the waivers and all the things that go there has supposed to create an access for folks experiencing homelessness and pay for some things under that Medi-Cal. So having that um, as a part of the conversation that goes into the ongoing, that's part of ongoing care because you're going to have to follow up with an individual who's gone from the streets into a housing um, option. So um, in that you know, thinking about, you know, the the no wrong door that was heavily used when it came to the Cal Lame and all of the things that were to unveil with Medi-Cal. Most of the population that are experiencing homelessness are Medi-Cal eligible. Those coming out of juvenile justice, those coming out of foster care. And of course, when those young people who are identified within our school systems that have IEPs that have been identified as McKinney Vento. So just want to throw that in there. That's tied to that no wrong door, but also that opportunity to get further and get better than just one time. I think um, I just, I want to chime in. I, I really like that no wrong door concept. It might not be exactly a door. I'm wondering if it's um, because what I'm thinking about where we're often hampered is like, oh, you don't might meet this specific criteria of homelessness. Can I figure out a way to make you like eligible? And it's it's ridiculous. So if you're experiencing housing instability, if you're a teenager who's couch surfing, help the couch surfing teenager, even if they're not literally on the street. So we have been hampered by these definitions that I don't think are serving us in, in the broader sense. And um, I've appreciated that the state has been more flexible than HUD, for example. But the most effective programs I work with have the least strings attached. So we're really able to tailor that what the client needs to their actual situation without worrying about whether or not they have the exact, you know, they meet the exact definitions. Our definitions haven't been super helpful, I don't think, in, in running a creative, responsive program. Great. Thank you all for that. And I see a few hands lining up. So I'm going to go to Emilio, then Ludmilla, and then Sam. So Emilio, you're up next. Thank you. Um, really like what I'm hearing. I, I know here locally we have um, a mantra that we all use here in LA County, uh, whatever it takes. And recognizing that sometimes government is the problem and we have to get out of the way. Recognizing that we need more housing, we need mental health. Uh, services. We need a variety of tools because it is such an incredibly complex issue uh, that uh, we need to come up with creative solutions tailored to each individual. And we try to sometimes, um, 
you know, I'm always trying to uh, break through to my team that, um, you know, let's not let our own rules and regulations get in the way of, of, of dealing with the person in front of us. And so I think that is a guiding North Star that we use to try to do anything and everything, sometimes even outside of what we think is within our boundaries uh, to make sure that we get somebody indoors. Great. Great. Appreciate that. And that's very catchy as well. So appreciate that example. Vanilla. Okay, I'm I'm not quite sure if this fits entirely in this discussion, but I I believe it has a great deal of relevance. Um, one thing I don't hear that I haven't heard, and, and um is is the triple bottom line. Okay, um, you know, looking at um, you know, in, environmental, economic, and equity. Um, in order to have something sustainable. Um, this triple bottom line concept is being talked about in a number of different areas. And the reason the public, um, uh, and thank you so much, you know, Megan, for, for, for your words on this too, is uh, the reason the public um, is, doesn't think this is a viable system is because it isn't, okay? It, it, it isn't, um, you know, the reason that, that homeless people, I'm speaking in very broad brush strokes here, but the reason homeless people is aren't aren't happy aren't getting served is because it's not a viable system. Okay, if 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 we if to the degree, you know, I thought we would have more time to to, to kind of work on this and adjust it, but with the budget cuts looking and and, and other factors that are happening in the real world right now, um, um, I I think we really need to um, think about this talk about it and act on it which is how can we implement the concepts from united nations sustainability goals triple bottom line have economic viability including the people who are homeless in the solutions as part of it um and 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 have this make more sense and i and it's not going to be viable until you have those three those, those at, at least those three things you know some some of the, the 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 entry points that that um I mean I could go into more detail but um I really would love to see programs and entry points that support the strengths of people experiencing homelessness. Currently, there's a there's some real big systemic problem areas in that only the needs are addressed or 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 used to prioritize. And the only way somebody can get into housing and sometimes into other programs is 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 through an intervention, an intervention. And how disempowering is that? And then those and then those needs and that need to be intervened on are locked in with with like a, a disability thing, which is what one needs to qualify, you know, to be able to afford the housing. There has to be a better way to do this. Um, one way to also have people who are using the system support it housing kind of buy-ins there's there's a lot of people who can who can afford who could afford something even if it's a spot for their rv or trailer or something for 300 dollars a month they can come up with that the problem is that people can't come up with the rents and 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 stuff like that in the in the in the, the prices they, the market prices that are that are now um you know out, out there um just um, I don't know. I've got I've got other notes, but but if we're looking at if if we can't answer the question of how does the work we're doing right now align with um, with the concepts, the overall concepts of the United Nations Sustainability Goals, the things that we're looking at worldwide to have a more sustainable planet, a more equi equitable exchanges with people, stronger communities. You know, uh, homelessness resolve. I think we're looking at communities. We're looking at transportation systems. How does, you know, how does, and at the, the housing we're built is built out and built out of renewable materials, um, has green space and landscaping in there that isn't just boxes piled on top of each other. Um, there's no absolutes here, or at least a lot in my in my world, but to the degree that we can achieve those, I think we're going to have more greater success. And, and to the degree that we're failing to do those, there's going to be this huge flaw and yeah. to the degree we're failing to, to include these triple bottom line concepts 
that we're going to have this huge flaw that just runs through the system where it's where it's an un, unsustainable. Um, okay. it, it's built on an unsustainable foundation. Anyways, I hope that doesn't. Well, I hope that helps. Thank you. Great, and I think there's some words in there that resonated. I think there's some of the concepts that might when we're going to go to guiding principles next. Some of those concepts might be able to be reflected in the guiding principles as well. So I'm going to go to Sam, and then I'm going to introduce the guiding principles, and then people can comment on those or circle back to the vision. So Sam. I actually think now maybe this is better for during the guiding principles, but <laughs> it sounds like to me a lot of people are um, like talking about operationalizing or concretizing housing as a human right. And I think that like in, in some spaces, housing as a human right has become like a sort of charged um, uh, phrase, but that's essentially what's been said. And I think that potentially just looking at the housing as a human right framework might lead you to some of the language that could be for lack of a better term, like a tagline, um, which I think is um, a, a challenging way to create a vision, but what it's worth. Great, great, appreciate that. So we can go back to the slide deck and I'll just walk through what the current guiding principles are. And then again, people can comment on those or we, or if it helps you think about what, what needs to be called out separately and distinctly in a vision statement. That's great too. I think we have about 14, 15 minutes left for this discussion. So we're in pretty good shape. So one of the things that the council wanted to ensure was that the plan would also communicate guiding principles that were aligned with the vision, that aligned with the goals that are being developed and that communicated um, some of the qualities of how the work is being implemented and what things are prioritized within that work. The current plan does have these guiding principles um, that are around pursuing racial equity and justice. Um, for each of these, there's a more detailed narrative description in the plan itself that helps explain what's the focus there. But really this one is the one that clearly zeroes in on populations who are experiencing the greatest risks of homelessness and needing to transform our systems to be able to um, redress and ultimately eliminate um, inequities and injustices across the system and more broadly than that. Second guiding principle focuses on creating solutions for the full diversity of people experiencing homelessness, which is really trying to get at the idea that we're, the plan is about trying to create solutions that touch upon um, everyone experiencing homelessness, but also does identify some populations that experience the greatest risk and we need to be tailoring our solutions for different populations. Third one focuses on seeking and valuing the expertise of people with lived experiences with homelessness and making that a central commitment within the work of the state and Cal ICH and other actors. Um, fourth one focused on strengthening housing first approaches, knowing that those practices are often not able to be fully achieved and implemented um, with, at the program level or the local level. And there's need for continued focus and emphasis on strengthening the ability to implement housing first with fidelity. Fifth one focused on balancing crisis response and permanent housing solutions, recognizing that permanent housing, however people are able to secure that is the what ends people's homelessness, but that we also need to be able to respond to the crises that people are experiencing tonight with solutions that help mitigate the impacts of those crises and help make it more possible for them to achieve permanent housing solutions. Um, I've lost count, but I think it's the sixth one is around advancing trauma-informed care and person-centered services and trying to put to add in some more detail of other kinds of best practices beyond just the, the housing first language and some of the things that need to be emphasized and how we deliver services to people. Um, I'm going to say it's the seventh one is around aligning health, housing, and homelessness strategies and trying to really communicate the idea that those are have to be linked strategies and need to be linked investments and ways of mobilizing across different systems to provide what people um, to provide possibilities and opportunities for people to succeed. And then the last one is around increasing access to resources for California's tribal communities. Um, again, we're not wedded to keeping these, keeping them the same, that the, it's a pretty open, open book for how we think about what guiding principles will get expressed in the plan. Um, next slide, please. But would love folks' reactions to, are there some of those guiding principles that seem less important to include at this time? 
Um, are there other important guiding principles that the plan should include? And part of this is things that we are ask, going to be asking council department, departments to explicitly commit to. Um, and then our, if you have thoughts on what would make it clearer that the council departments are committing to these principles through the adoption of the plan. Can you explain that piece about the commitment? I'm, sure. I'm not clear. So they, what makes yeah. them commit? Who, I mean, you know, because I'm all about demand. Yeah, so I think to date, all we've really been able to accomplish is to express them in the plan um, with the expectation and language in there that as, as we're adopting this plan at the state level, council departments are committing to these principles, but there hasn't been a great deal of accountability built into that. It may not be the most powerful way of communicating that, so we'd just love thoughts about how do, how do we further advance the idea that by adopting the plan, these these principles are intended to be infused throughout state activities and programs um, and strategies and thoughts about how to how to make that more real and create more accountability around that would be welcome. So again, I think a lot of what folks have said has been helpful for thinking about vision language, um, but a lot of it has also gotten down to details about how we need to think about structuring and delivering assistance and how to think about the roles of peoples themselves within creating the solutions. Um, some of which I think really can help inform guiding principles. But would love reactions to anything about what you think are important guiding principles, or by seeing these, if it gave you more ideas about the vision statement um, that we need to, to craft, that's welcome as well. And Elisa, I see your hand up. Thanks. Thanks, Matthew. I think it is related, and I don't have the exact language for it, but I think what's missing for me from the vision statement and trying to figure out how to add it into the guiding principles is that it does feel, I agree with Javon, like one directional and that there's not the, like when I think of a vision statement and aspiration, it is, what is the California that we're trying to create? Like a child born today will not have to experience homelessness based on their race or geography or where they come from. And so something about that kind of one California theme. And yeah. so and the guiding principles, I'm wondering if we can add something around like educating the public to seek, to support, um, uh, wait, to seek acceptance of successful practices, you know, because to me, we can't do this without when communities bypass building affordable housing or bypass um, substance use treatment facilities or any or encampment, you know, solutions. And so how do we share and like, how do we leverage the power of a state brand to overcome the fear of, you know, um, upsetting any local jurisdictions and really focusing on leveraging the power of the state to say we're in this together and this is a responsibility of everyone and we need communities to come on board. And I think, I don't know if that's data dashboards under education, but some kind of public facing education should be a part of this. Great, All right. thank you. Other folks who have reactions or ideas or even just a few words and phrases related to anything that we've talked about so far. Okay, Eric, I see your hand up. I'll go to you next and then Libin, I see you're back in line. So I'll go to you after that. Yeah, um, hello everyone. This is Eric Harris. I'm with Disability Rights California. Um, I really appreciate the conversation, and um, and I know that everyone who's here has has really great intentions to make sure that this is done correctly. Um, so I know, that, and also we attend a, a bunch of these types of meetings and kind of <laughs> trying to figure out and trying to plan what we're trying to accomplish. One thing that I think is particularly important, not just for the public, but also for all of us is a breakdown of data. Like, I don't know how many of us, even on this call, regularly attending these meetings, know what the data is showing in terms of like, how many people are being served consistently and how much improvement is there from the time that these meetings started to, the, to now. Um, how much are these are policies that are being put in place helping the communities that we're talking about? I mean, we come on these meetings every quarter or whatever it is to lift up how important equity is. But do we do, like has anybody broken down how much improvement there has been in terms of equity? Like how many more, um, you know, 
black homeless folks are are being served how many you know unhoused folks who who have english as a second language are being served how many disabled uh, uh unhoused folks are being served like all these different breakdowns of equity if they're a priority for the state if they're a priority for this group i think it's really vital that we know where some of the impacts are happening and where some of the gaps are um cuz i think we all just assume if we don't get the numbers that there are huge gaps and that the people that were not served um uh, who are unhoused 5 years ago are still the same people that are not served now um so i just i really want to lift up data as a key piece um that we should be leading these meetings with that oh man last time we met this is what was going on but now we have updated data to show you all that you know these improvements are being made um with uh testimonials from folks to be able to say yes i for you know 6 months ago i didn't have a place to live i didn't have any services but now i have you know what i need and i'm really excited about it so um i just want to lift that up for not just kind of this plan but just kind of as a whole um the ICH as a whole i really want to lift up data as something that we should be prioritizing in all of these discussions. Yep, appreciate that. And a quick response is that we are, as I think you're aware, crafting goals and within each of the goals, we're intending to zero in and identify inequities, disparities that currently exist that have to be addressed or redressed as part of pursuing that goal. And then I think also the, the clear one part of the plan is all gonna be focused on data strategies and will hopefully help drive more progress in some of the areas you're talking about. So um, I see a couple hands up. I see Ludmilla and I see Al. Um, Ludmilla, we are going to have a hard stop in a few minutes. So if you don't mind, I'm going to go to Al first since he hasn't had a chance to contribute yet. And then I'll come back to you if there's time. Um, but we do have to hard stop in about three minutes. So Al, I'm going to go to you next. Okay. All right. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Loud and clear. You know, I, you know, I, I actually support more data and really having more of an understanding of how some of these things relate to what is happening in the implementation of some of these plans. So maybe I'm thinking, well, how could this play out in terms of a guiding principle? And, and I think one of the things that would help, I think the community and, and of course myself and others would be maybe in the guiding principles a commitment to break it down in a very understandable way for the public. Yep. Because it just seems like, you know, we all know what these things mean. You know, a lot of us that have been in this work for a long time, we know what this means, but it would be helpful to see really what it means in terms of its breakdown in actual on the ground, things that are happening in real time, yep. or at least maybe not real time today, but real time in the last quarter or last several months. So I think within the guiding principles, maybe some type of a line that articulates a position of trying to break down this information into an understandable way so that individuals in the community can connect the dots. That was really helpful. Thank you for that. Ludmilla, you have a minute. Yeah, just on a on kind of on the earlier slide that that another um, uh, committee member commented on, uh, instead of like providing, I think better language would be um, opportunities and navigation for yeah. two. Just, just yeah. Great. I'll let you I'll let you figure out the prepositions and intro. No, I appreciate that. So helping make sure it's about. Empowering people and supporting their 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 solutions, but right, not providing the solutions to them. Or I mean, I appreciate your flag around the language of interventions as well. Anyone else with a quick thought before we turn? Yeah, to I have a quick thought. I was wondering to go back to the uh, the statement, and you know, when I think about envisioning, it means that you know, it's not it's not right now. It's something hoping or striving, right? You know, for this future where, where is that those who are unhoused, that it's rare, that it's brief. I kind of like that, but I think that there was someone, uh, I think it was Giovanni um, on, who 
who had mentioned something about being realistic. But it is a it isn't something in which uh, one could envision. But in addition to that, I think that in this statement, it has to be clear about uh, unique meeting unique needs or support in order for people to thrive. How important that is, because uh, you know what? Where's the where's the target? You know where's the mark that we're trying to actually hit? We it's not going to be the same for every single individual because people have different. Um, you know, experiences of being unhoused or intersections of being unhoused. And then uh, Al just spoke and what came to mind to me was about her providing data, but also, you know, we need to wake up sometimes and wake ourselves up about the mortality rates and what that actually looks like. So that we are being, the, the one thing that I'm hoping from California is that California takes a real bold approach and that it actually allows itself to be transparent in, in itself in order to be held accountable. And what that looks like is that it's calling out, it's saying what is uncomfortable to say. And that is the truth, that people are dying every single day, that we have the largest number of people that are unhoused. And then really, really, you know, message that. The other is around a uh, clear messaging in that breakdown. Because the public does need to know. We need to know, because I will tell you, I'm going to be quiet because I know we have to go. But I truly believe that the more people know and understand, and I'm talking about just, you know, my neighbor next door, who has nothing to do and don't know nothing about homeless and housing or the crisis that we're in, she just don't like it. But imagine people like her who was more informed more informed about, you know, the complexity of it all and then being able to say, oh, well, I want to help so-and-so. You know, how do we change the heart and mind? Where is the pull at the heart spring of the broader community to be a part of the solution to the problem? And and I, I want to email you, Matthew, because I, I have a whole lot of stuff written down uh, for you. I will. I will. Put my email address in the chat box before before we end the meeting. So I th I've been told we might have a little bit more time here for this discussion. So if there is someone who was standing standing back because of the time limit, um, I think we have a chance to take another comment. Anybody else who wants to jump in with any thoughts about anything about vision, guiding principles, any of that? I'll just say I appreciate everybody's comment. The root of tomorrow is in the lives and opportunity of our children today and our young people um, who will and is our leaders. Um, in being in these meetings, I love to see what that inflow, stability, and outflow data look like. Because when you hear the data, you at least have some grounding, even though I will say there are more people falling into homelessness than there are being housed. So with that, having some data and actually putting a pin and a data point to say, we're going to strive to house X amount of folks, provide services to X amount of folks to give us some leverage to say, okay, something is being done. It's not a mosh pit of data. It's not a mosh pit of just throwing people into saying, hey, homelessness exists. Yes, we know it exists. It gives that number. And then I think Eric spoke about those testimonials. It's important right now to give those experience at homelessness that human visual to see them, not just hear about them. Because eventually one day, which is terrifying for me to think that my child will have to inherit all of this work. And the question is, how much work did we do? It really helpful, appreciate all that I do, I think, the goals that we're striving to hopefully be able to include, I think we'll include some of those 
clear targets that we're shooting for. And then I, through this conversation, I really am struck looking back to the list of guiding principles we didn't write. Hey, hey, Matthew, Matthew, Joe, Claude, just one quick comment. You know, Reba mentioned mortality and pulling at the heartstrings and everything. And, you know, we just got, I just received the LA County coroner's uh, data on, on homelessness and mortality dying on the streets. And we need to advance mortality prevention. The data in LA County showed nearly 2,000 folks died while homeless in 2023. And of those folks, 10 of them were noted under the age category of 12 months or less. Infants, you know. And then, Javon, when you were saying about input and output, I mean, that's something that we're hearing more and more about. And I'm glad to hear you emphasize that because people need to know that a lot of continuums, a lot of jurisdictions are housing a lot of folks, but there's more people who are becoming homeless during the very same time that we're housing folks, you know. Uh, and again, in LA County, it's 200 per day are being housed, 227 become homeless per day, you know, yeah. so. Okay, appreciate flagging all of that. And yeah, just was, I'm struck that we don't have a guiding principle already that focuses on data and transparency. Can I just jump in one more time? Because what he said made me think about site, you know, and then I'm looking in the chat and Janet Kelly, has said, yes, I, I like something that falls within the one California theme, right? And and how do we get there? Because those silos need to be broken down. This is also part of the problem. And then it's always about money, right? Uh, oh, no, 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 uh, it's your job, you know? Uh, so how, how do we get to a place where there is more togetherness in this work? Thank you for that as well. I am going to consult with Cal ICH team. Are we? I do think we have. Um, I do think we might have secretary who's joined us. I saw one more person who joined, but I, I see another hand up. So before I can find that name, Matthew, if you'd like to call on the person with their hand raised. Let's see a hand raised here. So if there is someone who wants to jump in, please. Looks like Noah Whitaker. Which I'm so sorry that that's in that's in the the so Noah apologies for calling your name aloud. We will have general public comment. This portion of the meeting is meant for um for Cal ICH advisory committee members. So appreciate the hand, but if you can lower it until the uh, the public comment portion of the meeting. Thank you. Okay, so it sounds like we should wrap this up. I really appreciate everybody. I think a lot of us were taking notes. I think. The uh, vision statement will be striving to capture as many of these while also trying to keep it um, direct enough and easy enough for folks to remember. And then I think the guiding principles do create an opportunity to also add a lot more nuance and and ideas behind that those the vision. So appreciate all the conversation. And Cody, I guess I'll turn it back to you for now. Great. Thank you, Matthew. And yeah, I just want to echo Matthew's thanks to you all for just such a uh, deep and thorough conversation about how do we, you know, really be thoughtful about the vision for this work, right? And how do we make sure that we are being clear about what our work is and what we're trying to do, but also um, acknowledging the realities of the situation that we're in and the urgency that we face. Um, so it's a big, it's a big job. Uh, but we appreciate everyone's thoughts and, and we will come back for more feedback as we have more to respond to. Um, and Matthew obviously memorized everything everyone said and it's going to perfectly encapsulate what uh, we all want. No, but we will we will do our best to incorporate your feedback and really think through, you know, how can we create a, a vision and guiding principles that um, reflect what we talked about. So more to come on that. Um, I'm not sure if we have the secretary here. I know she's running late. Um, but in the meantime, Megan, I'm happy to pass it to you if you'd like. Yeah, thank you, Cody. So she is hopping on. Um, just received a, a text message to to that point. Um, but before she does, just want to do a very brief introduction uh, for this committee. You know, we've heard from subject matter experts uh, across our of our of our advisory committee. Um, we're very, very happy, very proud to have uh, another subject matter expert join us at the helm of BCSH. Uh, Secretary Moss comes to us 
uh, not not a not a unknown to the greater work of the council. She was appointed in 2022 as a Senate pro tem member, um, and so has been an, a, a fierce advocate um, on our council since that that appointment. Um, so we're we're very incredibly proud, happy to have her. Uh, she is um, already quickly making changes, already uh, you know ensuring that that we are person centered as an agency, um, as an entity for Cal ACH. Uh, so we're we're incredibly proud to uh, to have her join us. Does feel like I've I saw a person added in the panelists, uh, but I, I don't see that she's here quite yet. If we give her just a few more minutes, Vidakshika, before she she does uh, add on, if you would like to say anything to the credit of of Secretary Moss. Yes, I'd love to. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, uh, Advisory Committee, for all your work. Uh, discussing and help us kind of really create uh, a vision and goals that will, as you said, encapsulate how California as a whole is going to be partners with people on the ground and especially kind of taking into account people's lived expertise and how we need to really have, as Reba said, unique kind of interventions and services tailored to people's experiences. But as Megan mentioned, uh, we are so pleased um, to have uh, Secretary Mika Moss at the helm. Uh, some of me may have seen uh, two weeks ago, she was actually confirmed by the Senate, so it's official. Uh, Secretary uh, Moss is here also, I just told, but you'll hear from her and we are so pleased and proud to have her kind of helming BCSH and being the co-chair of the State Council. Secretary Moss. Thank you all so much. Thanks, Dr. Shika. Hi, everyone. Um, it's so good to see you all. Um, maybe we can take down uh, my uh, intro slide so I can see everyone's faces. Um, so first of all, apologies for being late. I was just finishing up a yet another meeting. That's There's a lot of meeting in this new role. Um, but uh, really excited to be with you all. I first wanna just start out by saying thank you. Um, you know, I sat on this council, as you all know, um, as a council member prior to my appointment to secretary. And um, it was really important to me as a council member to make sure that we had um, the voices of our community who are doing this work every day, who are leading the charge to address uh, homelessness in our communities across the state. And there is no better representation than this advisory council. And so I am so grateful to have your partnership and also to really, um, now that I have transitioned into the co-chair role with uh, Secretary Galley uh, of ICH, I really want to make sure that we are not just hearing from you and that, you know, that's important, but that we're using um, the expertise, wisdom, experiences to actually shift some of the ways in which we are working uh, in the state and with our local partners. Um, we have extraordinary staff. I just want to acknowledge um, Megan and her team um, who are just extraordinary professionals who it has not been easy folks as you all know these last few weeks we have been under a great deal of scrutiny um, around the way that we are trying to do this work and we welcome uh, critical feedback we want to make sure we are doing the best uh, we can do on behalf of the state of California and the people of California because frankly that's who I care about um, and so excellence is our game. And so with y'all's partnership, we are gonna be able to really strengthen the work that ICH, Cody and Megan and all of the team are doing, our data work, right? Like how do we actually not just pay attention to the numbers, but we actually see the impact that you all expect, that we all are expecting when we go out here and do this work every day. Um, so that's my priority as secretary is to figure out how we not only better tell the story of all the amazing work that's happening statewide um, in communities that you all are in, but also how do we leverage the resources that we do have to have the greatest impact we can. And I would be remiss not to acknowledge this, you know, insane um, budget reality that we are facing. It is um, real and what I've inherited, but I'm not dismayed by it. I think we have um, momentum 
you know, uh, th this issue isn't just a, pol you know, it's not just like a policy issue that like comes up for people. Like th these are people's lives. If we are unsuccessful, people are, do not survive if we do not address um, the crisis of homelessness in our communities. So that's the, the driver by which I engage in my role and that I want to welcome the, the partnership with this council because what you've already provided us, we took up your recommendations at our last council meeting and it was guidance and tonic, frankly, for many of the members of the council who wanna lean more in and do more um, and getting your guidance was super helpful. So I don't wanna talk your ear off. I know you've had a whole meeting, but I just wanted to come on and say thank you. Um, I'm excited to um, be in this work with you all. And if there's anything that I or my team can do to make this experience better for you, um, do let us know that. And if there are specific um, opportunities as we sort of expand some of the work that we're trying to do within the council um, that you all are particularly interested in, I really look forward to that input as well, because I wanna make sure that ICH is really the leading state entity on how we are addressing our homelessness crisis across the state of California, not, not just um, uh, guiding uh, or opining, but actually leading. And so, we can't do that without all of you. And so I am in deep gratitude to you all. Um, and I will be quiet now and pass it back to either Dr. Shika or Megan. Happy to answer any questions if folks have any, but um, that's what I wanted to check in about. Thank you, Secretary. And we, we do not have time at this point. We do uh, still have a public comment that needs to happen. Um, but uh, if folks are, are willing to, if you can put your cameras on, we'd like to just capture uh, this moment with a screenshot of uh, Secretary and of uh, of our, our advisory committee members. This is a little bit of a delicate process of I'm going to count to three. Um, have your cameras on, your smiles on, and we'll be good to go uh, with that. One, two, three. Great. All right, we do have... Um, one more page of folks. Uh, this is very, a very large committee, uh, Secretary, as I'm sure you can imagine. So if you give me a second, uh, this is why comms is so important. I'm not that person, but let's do that one more time. Switch to the second page. All right, folks, bear with me. Apologies. All right, and again, one, two, three. Great. All right. Thank you so much, Secretary. We very much appreciate your comments uh, and look forward to your continued leadership on the council and for Cal ACH. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over uh, back to back to Cody. Great. And I'm only going to speak to turn it over to Claire. <laughs> I'm requesting a redo on that um, visit. Uh, from our secretary, um, and I want to make sure that I'm saying it in this recorded space um, so that we can have her at the front of our agenda. Uh, so that is my Thanks, Reba. Yeah, definitely agree. I thought you were asking for a redo of the photo, and I was like, you haven't even seen it yet. How do you know? But yes, a redo of the secretary coming and speaking. I hear that. Thank you. Um, so Claire, if you are, if you want to kick us off yeah. with general public comment, I think we're ready yes. to go. Thank you, Cody. So now we will accept general public comments. Thank you all for your patience, and we appreciate all committee members for listening to public comments as well. We welcome all comments and feedback. However, due to the structure of this public meeting, we will not be able to respond to any questions or comments. Um, if you have any questions for Cal ICH or the committee, please email us at calich at bcsh.ca.gov. Everyone will get two minutes for their comment. A Cal ICH staff member, member will soon share their screen with a two minute countdown timer. And we will warn you when your time has expired. If you are connected through Zoom, select the raised hand icon in the meeting window on your computer. 
and I will ask you to unmute yourself once I allow you to speak. For those of us joining us by telephone, you may use the star nine to indicate that you would like to comment. Once I call on you to speak, you'll be instructed to press star six to unmute yourself. All right, so I already see some hands raised. Okay, Christopher Middleton, please make your comment. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Middleton. I'm a staff attorney slash Equal Justice Works Fellow at Youth Law Center. Uh, thank you all for allowing me to join this wonderful meeting and for all the wonderful work that you've been doing. I really appreciated the comment around agency and making sure that that was reflected in the language that y'all are developing. I also will say that California recently, especially in, in regards to access to specialty mental health service, has taken a really bold step to ensure that they provide certain populations of young people under the age of 21 with access to a variety of services under Medi-Cal. So while it's true that we want to respect, honor, uplift the agency of the many different young people and other folks who are experiencing homelessness, I do think that there is space to acknowledge that California has a really bold vision for what they're providing young folks and other communities as well. And to ensure that we don't just have like a champagne vision on a beer budget, that we actually look at the implementation of the bold programs that we're designing to ensure that they're having the intended outcome that they're looking at. In particular, this new kind of focus on access to especially to mental health services. There was a really insightful report put out by the National Health Law Program covering the five most populous counties in regards to like young people in foster care and found like pretty insufficient like layout of procedures, access opportunities and knowledge among staff that really raises the concern of what we have on paper not being really reflected on the reality of young people who are vulnerable. And so just wanted to uplift that and thank you all for your time. Happy to send that over to Cody, um, the report that I mentioned, and thank you all. Thank you so much. All right. The next hand I see is from Noah Whitaker. All right. Please unmute and make your comment. Hi, uh, Noah Whitaker, Tulare County. Just checking first to make sure you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, so part of my comment is really uh, more of intended to be uh, perhaps a challenge uh, or a thought challenge for the commission. And that's um, looking at goals that are other than focused at the local level, because it really feels like a lot of these goals, the achievability of them, the implementation, the tracking, et cetera, all occurs at the local level. Um, but I would love to see some goals that are targeted at the state itself and in particular at the state legislator, uh, because we're going to constantly run into these issues if we set up goals and objectives ourselves that then the legislator is not uh, informed about and writes legislation that makes the achievement of these goals and objectives more challenging. And there was the, a little bit of discussion earlier about some of the definitions, uh, and I do love the flexibility of the state. Uh, in the definition that's much more broad and enables us to help more people than the HUD definition. But I think we need at least a goal or an objective of some kind of the state working closely with the federal government to modify some of the goals and terms that they use, uh, because that's what's going to create a lot of bottlenecks and limits for us at the local level. Uh, for example, trying to work under the state's broader rules uh, while also working with an individual to get a housing voucher that must meet HUD standards immediately creates a conflict in which the individual meets state definition of homelessness, but not the federal definition, and cannot obtain one of these housing vouchers. And some of the actions or activities that we may take based off of the state's definition can erode or undermine the ability to qualify under the federal definition. So I think that those are really important uh, points. But I really, really would love to see more of an educational campaign for the legislator as they're the ones writing the laws that each of us now have to implement on the ground. Uh, so those are, are sort of my main thoughts and also that challenge to stay connected to the local level. So this is an ivory tower. My time's up, thank you. 
Thank you very much, Noah. Okay. I see no other, oh, okay. Janelle, we've got another hand raised. Janelle, go ahead and unmute and make your comment. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Um, I wanna thank all of you for all of your work. Um, it's wonderful to hear all the different perspectives um, and I agree with almost all of them, which is, but there's one thing that um, I would like to add, and that is that there is, I think, a tool that we aren't using, and that's the shelter crisis code. It's in the government code. It, um, it was changed a few years ago to specifically say that it could be used, uh, localities could declare a shelter crisis and take action to set up shelters. But in also at the same time, or around the same time, HCD came out with an alternate building code that included tents and things like that. But the focus turned to shelter, I think maybe because of the Boise decision. And so I think we need to stop looking at shelter and instead look at having people have a place to live we have a real housing crisis and people need a place to live in the meantime. And I think the shelter crisis codes along with um, tenancy, which is a housing first um, idea and bedrock part of housing first um, could help. I don't know about in the cities, you'd have Harder, but up in Humboldt County, it could. In Hama County, it could. In in Del Norte County, and you know the Central Valley, it could help. Um, and I would like to see that happen. Thanks, and thanks again for all your work. All right, thank you. Okay, I see no more hands raised at this time. So I will now pass it back over to Cody to close out the meeting. Great, thank you all. Um, and thanks again to all of our committee members for your insights and your comments during our meet meeting today. Uh, thank you to those who presented, um, Matthew and Secretary Moss, really appreciate your time with us. And, and Megan, of course, um, appreciate your time with us today. Um, as you can see, we're working hard to move uh, our work forward and, and take all of your expertise and incorporate it into the council's work. So, and we can only do that when y'all are giving us your thoughtful input and attention. So really appreciate that. Um, our next committee meeting will be on August 22nd, 2024 at 1 p.m. Um, I also wanna thank the members of our public who attended this meeting. We really appreciate your interest in our work and your consistent uh, attendance of these meetings and, and all of your thoughts that you provide. Um, so we hope you'll listen into our council meeting as well on June 12th at 1 p.m. Um, and the next advisory committee meeting. So with that, the meeting is adjourned at 3.13 p.m. Thank you all very much. To receive up-to-date information on the council's activities, you can sign up on the council's email list there's a sign up option on the council's webpage. We also encourage you to follow Cal ICH on our various social media platforms, which are here on the screen. Um, and see you all again soon. Really appreciate it.